Hey folks, it's Marvin Cash, the host of the Articulate Fly. We're back with another Casting Angles with Mac Brown. How you doing, Mac? Doing great, Marvin. How you doing? As always, I'm just trying to stay out of trouble. And uh, I know you're a happy man because you just finished one of those long uh, weekend uh, fly fishing schools, right? Yeah, we just wrapped it up on Sunday. And we had five days, five days of fun with rowing and casting and all kinds of stream tactics. And uh, that was a, that was a great group of folks we had the last five days. Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, it's interesting, too, because I was um, up in central Virginia this past weekend. And I think it's kind of the same thing in your neck of the woods. Like, it's officially gone from winter to spring. And I looked at your weather and you're going to be spring-like from a temperature perspective, maybe a little bit wet. What do you expect to see on the water? Well, right now we're still seeing a lot of hatches starting around noon, like noon till about four o'clock. And there's a lot of, today we had a lot of blue wings because it's overcast. And um, that's mainly what we saw today is blue wings, a few microcatus here and there, but mostly blue wing olives. And so we fished a lot of the the blue wings later on in the day, like three o'clock or so is when they started coming off pretty good. And nothing, we didn't really see a lot of other hatches like in the morning. It was fairly slow, actually, because there's a front coming through. That kind of put a damper on on the normal activity for today. But, um, yeah, the blue wings are always fun. Yeah, absolutely. And we were talking, we were kind of trying to brainstorm about what we wanted to talk to folks about this time. And I think last time we talked about practicing with intention. And I think this time we wanted to talk about kind of rigging and having a fishing process with intention. You want to kind of kick that off for us? Sure. Yeah, just talking about the little micro adjustments that are made. And what made me kind of think of that was from what happened, you know, the past five days. And a lot of the folks would be like, for them, it would be like an epiphany of adding a little bit of of length to tip it when we're, we had to fish, you know, down deep a couple of those days with real bright blue, blue sky weather. And of course, fish don't have eyelids, the so fish hold tight to the bottom. So to keep the fly on the bottom, would be just a simple adjustment of just adding a foot or two a tippet. And uh, usually we lengthen that when, you know, water's either deeper or water's a lot faster. Either one, we, we need to lengthen it. So I think that was, that's kind of struck home, thinking that'd be a good topic to talk about tonight. Yeah, and you and I were talking before we started recording, and I guess we kind of we kind of broke that down maybe kind of in two different ways. And one was, you know, making sure that you're following uh, the food through the water column as the day progresses, right? That's kind of point number one. And then there's the refinements that happen when you know what layer of the water column the food's in to adjust your drift and your presentation so that you can get the fish. That's right. And a lot of that's the observation of, you know, like today was a good example. I had a group from uh, above Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And today that happened with uh, – just seeing all the, the swallows and the martins feeding on bugs all of a sudden. I mean, we hadn't seen a bird in the water all day long. And about maybe 3 o'clock, look downstream, and there's 40 birds feeding. And right away, you know, they're eating eating insects. So we were still fishing deep, and it started to get slow. The only way you can really ever tell that's going on on an overcast day like this is just look for the birds. Once you see all those birds, and it's time to move up. So all we had to do was take off the... You know, the weighted fly didn't change anything. I mean, because they were, they were fishing that uh, weighted fly just off a of fly line at about maybe 15 feet a liter. And all we had to do is put on a 18 emerger, soft tackle emerger, and then boom. How we know that was the right thing. In the first cast, he hooked up. Two casts later, he hooked up. So in three casts, two fish, it hit. So that, that way it gives you affirmation that, yeah, this is the right thing to be doing. And a lot of times it's the birds and those little clues, you know, an observation that help help remind us of that. Because those little tiny, tiny blue wings in an overcast day, I mean, you really tough to see them. You know, I mean, we, for us, it's hard to see them. I mean, the birds obviously have way better vision than we do. Yeah, it's interesting, too, right? Because, I mean, as you kind of think about, like, as a general rule of thumb, right, if you come out in the morning and you don't see anything, you probably know you're going to start on the bottom, and as the day warms up, right, to your point, you're going to see either fish feeding on top um, or feeding mid-column, right, or you're going to see birds or some other evidence that you've got more hatch activity. And that's when you kind of start to move up the column. And then, 
you know, some days it stops and you have to start kind of following the bugs back down the column too, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. And the other thing is, is geese. Like geese are huge insectivores. So when you see the geese out treading water in a foam line and they'll line up, you know, one after the other, and you'll see their little, their little beaks just one after the other just scooping them up. In other words, they're huge insectivores. So when I see geese out treading water, those were actually doing that today too. But it's it's hard to pick up. I mean, it really is when they move up on an overcast day because it's not like there was a lot of them uh, flying around in the air. And as far as rises go, uh, that definitely was the right thing to do like for today. But when I think about it, there's only three fish all day that showed themselves on the top rising. So even though they're emerging, where are they getting eaten? Most of them under the film. Because literally, while we were while we, while the while that took place, and he picked up two out of those three, like when we made that transition, and his then his buddy started picking them up, there was still only those three rises that whole time it, it took place. So just because there's only three rises doesn't mean there needs to be fifty or a hundred rises. That that's pretty normal. Yeah, I would also say too, right? If you're lucky enough to fish with a buddy, right, you can kind of bracket it in, right? So one guy fishes bottom and mid column, and the other guy fishes top and mid column. If you don't know what to do, and hopefully, if you guys are yep. yeah, roughly the same ability level, you ought to figure out what they're eating, and then everybody switches, right? Oh yeah, that's what we do, guiding a lot. I mean, when we're on the water, yeah. If we're not sure, it's real easy to keep separating and have one rigged a little bit higher for immersions, and one rigged a little bit deeper, and keep playing that game until we start to figure out some pattern here. And I think that's always smart rather than having both of them, you know, rig. I very rarely rig both people the same unless something's really happening and we're on it. If we're in the process of uh, still making sure that's what it is, we're usually rigged different. Yeah. So if you have a pretty good idea, right, they're either feeding on the bottom or mid column or in the upper part of the column, you know, what are kind of your suggestions for kind of the adjustments you make where you're like, you're pretty confident that's where the food and the fish are eating, but you're not getting the results you want in terms of how to refine depth and drift and all that kind of good stuff. Well, part of it, it's been easy. Like during the five days of the school, we had two days that were bright blue sky with no, no cloud cover whatsoever. And that's real easy. Like anytime it's that way, it's best to start right on the bottom. And so if we air, we're going to air with having tip it longer, you know, longer than necessary. So when we fished up in Webster that first day, I think on Thursday last week, and uh, we fished, let's say we we're fishing about four feet of water. And I had most of them rigged between seven to seven and a half feet because the water speed was about four and a half to five feet, you know, per second. And a lot of people wonder what that is, but it's just pretty simple. Look at a foam line, look at a stick floating by, 1,001, how far did it move? And um, that seemed to be about the right rigging, what we were using. And um, I think that's that's always a big clue. If you, if you know you're staying in waist-deep water or knee-deep water, that's kind of what, what helps determine that rigging depth. And um, that just seems to work universally. I mean, I think most Irish gillies, if it's bright blue sky, they're going to start out the same way. And it's just, we're not going to start out fishing up high ever in the morning when it's bright blue sky day like that. So I guess too then, right, you're also, uh, I, I think your general preference, right, is to use more leader length than weight, right? Leader length, yeah, yes. Yeah, because we could lift and reset, tuck, tuck ties. We could do a whole lot of things uh, to put a fly deep. And another way, fish it, fish it downstream. Um, you could lift and reset it. You could tuck cast it. There's a lot of ways to do it. And so a lot of people on, on trips, for instance, they usually don't have a tuck cast. I'd say there's, I don't know, if I was being conservative, I'd say maybe 2% of clients in 38 years could actually tuck cast. Okay, so even though it's talked about all the time, it's not something the practical average guide trip is going to happen. You know, so there's all these other tricks that do the same thing that we can do that are just as effective but it's not necessarily coming from just the cast. And so does that, does that kind of answer? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I guess it's at a certain point, right. Length is length, but I guess, so for example, like comp guys, we were talking about this before we started recording, right. To like sink a pertagon, yeah. you know, they can basically, they don't need to have one that's got like a four millimeter bead on it to get to the bottom, even in fast water, because they're accomplishing that with a really thin leader. 
and that's uh, right. And yeah, they, yeah. And they I see can, what you mean. Yeah, and so basically, what we're talking about doing is, um, and this kind of gets into strike detection, right? Is we want, you know, if you can, uh, the less weight you use, the better your strike detection. And so, I guess I was saying, like, your preference is you're going to elongate your leader to get down if you need to, as opposed to adding more weight. Oh yeah, yeah. That's what we. I remember now when we talked about before. Yeah, I mean, I think the old school method. 30 years ago, it was just say, add more split shot, you know, separate them if you want. There's a lot of ways to do that. You know, I don't, I hadn't used split shot in 20 years. So, but um, yeah, I think the other way to do it is, is just lengthen the leader. And you could take a real air, you know, hydrodynamic fly, like a pertagon with a two and a half millimeter bead and put it down in really fast water just by having the lift and reset and have a long enough tippet. And that'll go down just as fast. And I just don't think that 30 years ago, people knew that. Because because it was always had more weight, and I think that's the wrong answer. At this day and time, there's too many other techniques that can put a light fly down fast. Once we understand the angles and the tippet size and all that other good stuff. Yeah, and that was kind of what we were talking about, right? So if in the old days people were you know probably fishing more indicators than they are today, right? That made it harder. Like the way you're controlling depth without additional weight is basically angle, right? So if you want it deep, you really want that leader perpendicular to the water surface, right? Whereas if you want to fish up the column, you basically start flat, flattening out that leader angle, right? Yeah, if we lift and reset, yeah, we'd go in vertical, but we could also do it from, say, going down below with a shallow angle, a shallow triangle, and just feed it, feed it line, boom, and it'll drop like a rock. Uh, there's a lot of ways. Yeah, but it's an angle game. And, and probably the best way to... To get to that is is fish something. Well, I think we talked about this before on the podcast. To to use something brightly covered. I mean, the color of the pattern you're using, where you can see it, like in three to four foot water of different speeds, and you can tell that you thought it was deep, but it was only a couple inches deep. You thought it was deep, but it was six inches deep. You follow follow along what I'm saying. That that way, you kind of learn what your efforts and these angles do to where it's truly on the bottom, and now you're hooking up sticks and rocks on the bottom. And I think that's the best way for folks to get there and understand that because once we develop those skills with a brightly colored fly, then we can put on something that's black that we can't see. And we know where it is because we know what our efforts do. Yeah. I think that's the quickest way for people to learn it. Yeah. And then we talk about like making minor adjustments. If you're fishing shot, you can use tungsten putty, right? Um, And add, Mm -hmm. add putty to the shot. And that's a way to kind of really kind of dial your drift in for people that are fishing, kind of mid column kind of what are your thoughts there i guess do you just basically go with like lighter beads like if you need weight you use glass beads or kind of how do you like to kind of dial in to the to the mid column strike zone well i still use that putty it's funny you said that because we didn't talk about that earlier but i still have a lot of that that soft uh tungsten putty you just roll it in your fingers roll it into a little taper like a little football shape and put it on i love that stuff and when it gets cold and hits cold water boom it locks up just like And what's nice about it is it's not like being crimped on with some hemostats like a BB split shot or something in the old days. I just think it's much, much better, the soft putty, because you can put on exactly what you want and put it in different spots. And it's not ever deforming the nylon. The problem with split shot, we didn't used to really know this as a kid, but it definitely deforms the monofilament. When somebody grabs some hemostats and just mashes it on, after a couple of fish, you've already elongated and flattened the you know what I'm saying? The nylon and created a weak spot. And if you notice a lot of times when something breaks off, it's not broke. It's broke off like at the split shot. Yeah. That's why I say that I, don't, I think split shots old school. There's too many good things to replace it, you know, like the putty. That's good. You brought that up. Cause I, that putty is, is absolutely, I still put a bunch of it right in front of my cork. It sits on the rod. So when I want it, it's right there. If I think I want to add a little bit of something, I can put it on above. You know, I can make it quick. Yeah, it's interesting too, right? And then I, I would have guessed, right, probably the best way kind of when you're fishing, like, I don't know, let's just say the first, I don't know, surface to maybe four to six inches is is you're probably, you, you've got a little bit of tungsten putty, but then you can also, right, you can play around with um, how you grease the leader, right? So you can kind of make the, right. you can really grease it like close to the fly and it's going to f- make that fly float really high in the column. But if you don't grease it quite like that, it's going to drop a little bit more on you, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we use a lot of the – if I wanted to float the nylon up higher, we use a lot of snow seal. Like you put on your T-1 
telemark boots, you know, the snow seal you buy in a little brown can. It's been around for, I don't know, it's been around 50 plus years. The snow seal, it's like beeswax. And that that's really, really great. Yeah, it gives me a Boy Scout flashback. I can see that little blue, uh, light blue and dark blue tin with the snowflake on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, snow seal. And then they, yeah, it, it is, there's a lot of them. There's another one called snow proof. It's pretty similar. But it's beeswax as well, and either one of those is what we use to float up uh, monofilament, and, and that works really well. And if we're trying to sink something, like really talking about making these micro adjustments, so we, here's a step further: is we use snow seal for a certain amount. And if we're trying to fish, say, up in the film, like my favorite blue wing day, always in the winter is when the meniscus is going to be really elastic, and the, and small bugs like blue wings can't come through. So a good example of that would be cold water, high pressure. And the blue wings try to come out, but they can't bust through the surface. So there's a smorgasbord of thousands of insects trapped right under the surface, knocking on the door, but they can't get through. That's where you see those porpoises and eating all up under in the film. So there you got your snow seal to keep that fly high. And then a few inches from the fly, we put fuller's earth with glycerin. And that's going to break the surface film. And it puts that bug literally two inches, three inches. You can do it however far you want. But it's usually between that one to five inch mark to where you're trying to put those bugs right up in the top. Cause that's where the, that's where they just keep churning going down the stream. Cause they tried to hatch, they didn't make it. So there's a whole bunch of bugs that half emerge. Some of them emerge and they still can't get through. So that's, that's the ones that are probably the best blue wing hatches of the winter. Even in the spring. Yeah, you know, folks, we love questions on the Articulate Fly. You can email them to us or DM us on social media. We'd love to answer your questions. We love them. Uh, so you can either, you know, hit me up or hit Mac up. And, uh, you know, Mac, I know you're just done with the school, but, I mean, you got a little bit of travel and all sorts of cool stuff coming up. You want to let folks know? Yeah, we're going to head up to Harrisburg, the 14th, to the Harrisburg Fly Fishing Club in Pennsylvania. And looking forward to that. And then we have our casting event the 22nd 23rd that weekend a lot of trips in between now and then and of course we got another school coming up in may and then we get to go up to run the school up there in the driftless the boot camp we're going to do in the driftless with jason randall on june 8th to june 11th and um if anybody has any questions they can message me either on instagram or facebook at macbrownflyfish.com is a website yeah and all that i know all that stuff's on your website and you just updated your payment processor <laughs> there you go <laughs> well i appreciate it marvin i appreciate you having me back yeah absolutely we'll keep doing this and uh folks you know it's starting to warm up you probably have spring break either probably this week or next week you owe it to yourself to get out there and catch a few tight lines everybody tight lines mac tight lines marvin <laughs> <laughs>